right? There are many languages, and if we have too much information, if we are born too much information, with too much information in the brain, uh, we won't be able to, to, to learn languages that differ in very important ways. But on the other hand, uh, what we have as a genetic endowment, it cannot be too little either, because if it's too little, it won't be much help in learning. So it must be something like uh, Goldilocks. Not too big, not too small, not too hot, not too cold. Yes, yeah, something in between. But what, what exactly could it be? What could it be? And uh, Chomsky goes like this. Well, what do we really need for a language? We need thought and we need, I said here, sound, but that's not necessarily the case. Some form of expression. It could be sign language, yeah, because that's a language too, right? So we certainly need these two. It's what he, he calls the interfaces. And what is language? <coughs> language is something that is in between. It's something that links thought with sound, right? <coughs> and he says it is the perfect solution to the interface uh, conditions. Uh, interface, that thought and sound are interfacing. And language is the perfect solution to uh, this question. The question how to link thought with sound. Okay? Perfect solution. And he says uh, something quite poetic, that uh, if it's true that it's the perfect solution to linking uh, thought with sound, then it's like a snowflake. It's determined by uh, condition, by uh, objective conditions, right? So language is something like this. Uh, there is, inside the bubble, there is thought, and outside there is sound, and they press, and they determine the form of language. Language couldn't be square, it couldn't be a triangle, it must be like this, because uh, it is forced by the two interfaces. So, okay, uh, language is perfect, we are born with uh, this perfection, but what exactly is it? And uh, he came, uh, Chomsky's uh, conclusion is that we have uh, what we need to link thought with sound uh, is a kind of operation, a rule that permits us to combine simple things into more complex things. And this process of combining uh, is unbounded, is recursive. We do it again and again and we create more and more complex structures out of simpler structures. That he calls merge. Right? Uh, so this is one thing that we need and this is uh, allegedly universal. That's what everybody is born with. Apart from that, to combine, what do we combine? We need something to combine. We have an operation that combines things, and now we need things. And that is the lexicon, let's say vocabulary, dictionary. And this is uh, language specific. This uh, depends on particular languages. It's different from a language to the other. And all the differences among, uh, across languages are determined by differences in the lexicon. When merge combines elements from the lexicon, the results, the outputs, are different depending on the properties of the elements here. Okay, so that's, uh, sorry, uh, where language variation comes from. And this is the primary component of language. There is the secondary component of language, um, and that is closer to the sound uh, interface. And here uh, we notice uh, two things about this. We notice that uh, there, the, the way it is, language is externalized is not fixed. We can externalize language with sounds. Uh, we can also uh, externalize it with gestures. We can externalize it in writing. So it's not fixed. It's not necessary. Um, and it is necessary, but it's not uh, logically necessary to choose one particular way, sound. And we find here 
various imperfections. Imperfections. Uh, what exactly uh, are the imperfections? Uh, as we come towards sounds and morphology, yes, morphology is that branch of linguistic that studies combinations of parts of words to make words. When we come to morphology, we have, we have here all kinds of exceptions, accidents, uh, historical accidents, right? Uh, so uh, from the fact that uh, the external uh, part of language, let's call it sound, uh, the way it is externalized is not fixed, and we find all kinds of accidents and exceptions, uh, that uh, makes Chomsky conclude uh, that this is not primary, it is secondary. And language appeared uh, mainly as an instrument of thought. So uh, language is language of thought. Okay. So, what are the, the functions of language? What is the function of language? Language is an instrument of thought. It is for thinking. And uh, yeah. uh, not only it is an instrument of thinking, but thinking, the ability to think, is created uh, as uh, we use language. That's what he says in the quotation. Yeah. So the importance, we think of thought and language, thought is more important, and language is created mostly, mainly for thought. Yeah? So, uh, what does it say? Okay. Uh, animals will see this, uh, but when we look at certain things, we will not see only this, we will see something like this. Okay? Language makes us put things together and see a bigger picture that animals cannot see. Okay? And uh, not only we see uh, certain structures, uh, but we categorize them, we classify them. So when we see uh, Archimboldo's summer, yeah, we know that it's not something like this, but it's more something like this. Right? So language uh, has a function of structuring things and helping us classify things. Okay? That's quite a big deal. Okay? So how, how did language evolve? How did it appear? And here is uh, Chomsky's answer. That uh, there was a very small mutation and this small mutation allowed certain individuals uh, to uh, merge, okay? uh, to combine things and create more complex structures. And as they acquired this capacity, their thought, their thinking abilities developed. But this must be something individual. And, uh, the individuals who had this gift, they transmitted the gift to their children. And some breeding groups that were uh, clever and could do more things than the people who could not uh, combine ideas in their head and uh, plan and strategize, um, those uh, people at some point needed to communicate. But basically, language appeared uh, in the evolution of thought. And communication is secondary. Okay? This is his logical conclusion, thinking uh, deductively, from his hypothesis that language is something, a genetic endowment. Right? And he says here, it is not easy to imagine an account of human evolution that does not assume at least that much. But some people, uh, have imagined other accounts, and I'm going to introduce now a different account. And uh, this account has been proposed by Michael Tomazello, who is a linguist and uh, psychologist.
anthropologist, uh, director of the Max Planck Institute of uh, Anthropology. Right? Uh, and uh, Tomazero's claim is that we cannot understand language without understanding gesture. Gesture is central. Gestures, right? Uh, when you think about gestures, they seem very simple, uh, but actually they are not so simple. Okay? Let's take the pointing gesture. Okay? The pointing gesture. Uh, the pointing gesture in itself does not mean anything. If I point like this, or if I point like this, what I'm trying to tell you is different each time. So the gesture itself means nothing. Right? Uh, but let's say that um, it's very cold in this room, and I point at the window. You will probably think she wants me to close the window because it's cold in here, right? But let's say that it's not cold in here. It rained before, and now it's sunny, and I point at the window, and the window is not open. You look through the window, and you see a rainbow in the sky. Ah, she wanted me to look at the rainbow because it's so beautiful. So you could say that the context, yes, the situation, the context determines uh, the meaning of the gesture. But that's not necessary. It's not enough. Let's say that I uh, point towards the parking, and uh, there is Sean's car, and I'm pointing at Sean's car. Uh, of course, uh, you will understand she wants me to look at Sean's car, but uh, you will wonder why. And uh, the meaning could be quite different. Uh, for example, I know that you are friends with uh, Sean, but uh, recently you had a terrible fight, and Sean uh, threatened uh, to punch you horribly uh, if uh, he meets you. Then my gesture means, uh, be careful, Sean is around. You better not go there, right? Uh, but uh, it, if I just know that you are friends, the gesture means, oh, uh, here is Sean, let's go and uh, invite him to lunch, right? Uh, but, you see, this is not context, this is shared knowledge, right? What we know about what we see. Uh, but shared knowledge uh, is uh, quite complicated. It doesn't just mean to have the same knowledge in the head. For example, uh, you had the fight with Sean, and there was the threat, but you don't know that I know about uh, the incident. Then my gesture could not mean the same thing. You understand? Uh, so you must know that I know what you know. And I must know that you know that I know what you know. Right? Uh, so uh, a simple thing, like a gesture, is actually something quite complicated. Right? And uh, Tomazaro's claim is that here we have the seed of human language. Uh, but what is very important is the last thing, the assumption of relevance. Uh, you try to imagine what I want to say when I point because you think that when I'm pointing, I'm trying to be helpful to give you some information that is useful for you. So this is the basic assumption in human communication.